Hi, everybody. Grab a Bible, open it up to John chapter 5. Shout out to Hunter. Well done. John is sick, so he got two days' notice to lead today. I love it that God is raising up the next generation of leaders around here. When you do academic research, there are two kinds of sources that you look to. One are the original sources, written by the actual people from the day. The other are known as secondary sources. Secondary sources comment about and write upon and interpret the original sources. And once you get into higher level academia, you are required to work with the original resources. You can't just look at what someone said about such work. You have to look at the work itself. For example, if you were to talk to a Shakespeare scholar, they should probably be able to tell you what is their favorite play because they should have read Shakespeare, not just have opinions about what the other people have said about Shakespeare. They should actually know Shakespeare. Not that long ago, I was having a conversation with a guy about theology. I tend to do that. And I quoted John Calvin, which, again, I tend to do that. And he said, oh, I hate Calvinism. Okay. I said, so which part of institutes of the Christian religion don't you like? And he said, I don't know what that is. It's like, hence your problem. <laughs> institutes of the Christian religion is the systematic theology book written by John Calvin. You can't say you hate Calvinism if you don't know what it says. So maybe buy a copy of Institutes of the Christian Religion. You have to go to the sources. The rallying cry of the Protestant Reformation was ad fontes, the Latin phrase meaning to the sources. Let's, let's drop this church tradition, what so-and-so said about the text. The text means everything. No, 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 we're gonna to go to the sources. Let's go to what the Bible actually says. As we conclude Jesus' sermon in John chapter five, he takes us back to all of the original sources. Chapter five, let's start in verse 37. And the Father who sent me, he has borne witness about me. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. And you do not have his word abiding in you for you do not believe him whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that bear witness about me and you're unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that's from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Let's review where we are. Jesus has gotten himself into trouble with religious leaders and they're actively seeking to kill him. And he launches into this unknown sermon from John 5 where he presses in over and over again about his identity, who he is as God's son, this one who is like God and images God to the world. And there is this courtroom scene that happens multiple times throughout John, but it's certainly happening here where Jesus acting as the prosecutor calls witnesses to the stand who testify on his behalf. And we saw last week, he called John the Baptist. He called his own works, his life and ministry to the stand. And, and now he's gonna close out by calling two more. And as he does so, Jesus will not function here only as the prosecutor. We're gonna blend some metaphors because though he's functioning as a prosecutor, he's also gonna serve as the great physician, a good doctor who uses his closing arguments to help them see their dilemma. And when you go to the doctor, you're after two things. You're after a diagnosis and you're after a prognosis, both Greek words that are both in your New Testament. 
You're after a diagnosis, you wanna know what's going on right now. What's the problem, what's causing this? And you want the prognosis. Where's this going? What should I expect to have happen? What's the treatment plan? You want both of those. Jesus now gives to this group both. This is a group of religious leaders and a crowd of people who are rejecting him and he tells them this is why you are rejecting me and this is what to expect because you're rejecting me. So two stages of rejection. Number one, the diagnosis. Jesus is coming to his conclusion here for his sermon. Everything's been moving towards these handful of verses. He's now in the home stretch and he's placing the truth right before their face and calling out their sin of rejection of him. And he tells them the cause. The first cause is unbelief. The sin of unbelief. Go back to verse 37. And the father who sent me, he's borne witness about me. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. The father sent me, which is a direct repetition of the last phrase of verse 36. He says that two sentences in a row that the father has sent him. I've come from God. I have all authority. He sent me. So picture the courtroom scene as he now calls God to the witness stand. Again, if you want to have a good witness, he's probably going to top the list. So imagine as God descends on the courtroom and rips off the roof of the, the building and like the, the scene at the temple in Isaiah chapter 6, the glory of the Lord descends and the train of his temple fills the, the temple with glory. And all of a sudden, this magnificent presence of God has come and has arrived in the courtroom. Or, or think of the, the top of Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus when God descends to give the law to his people and there's thunder and there's lightning. This has now come into the courtroom as God takes his place to testify about Jesus. When did God testify about Jesus? Well, he certainly did indirectly from start to finish throughout Jesus' life and ministry. He testifies to Jesus throughout the scriptures, testifies to Jesus throughout creation, but on a number of occasions, God himself personally and directly testifies about the Lord Jesus. He does so at Jesus' baptism Matthew chapter three, Mark chapter one, Luke chapter three, that at his baptism, the father speaks audibly and says, this is my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. That's a good testimony from God. He does it again at what's known as the transfiguration when Jesus goes up on that mountain with his three closest disciples. Matthew 17, Mark nine, Luke nine, and there in that place, God the Father speaks again, this is my son, my chosen one whom I love, listen to him. John chapter 12 will record this random moment where Jesus is referring to the cross to come and he says, Father, what should I say at this hour? Glorify your name and God audibly replies and says, I have glorified my name and I will glorify it again. And the crowd flips out and he's like, I think it thundered. Like, no, that was just the creator speaking. So we've got this audible, direct testimony from God the Father that backs up everything that Jesus has said about himself. And just to draw the contrast with these religious leaders in the crowd, Jesus says to them, you've not heard his voice and you haven't seen his form. You don't know what you're talking about. You haven't heard his voice. Noah and Abraham and Moses and Samuel and Elijah all heard God's voice. You haven't seen his form. Abraham and Jacob, and Moses and Isaiah all saw a form of God. So Jesus is letting them know, listen, you're not like them. You're not in the same line as the patriarchs. You're not in the same line as the prophets. You think you're a big deal, you're not. Because God has revealed himself to testify about who I am and you have completely ignored every word that he said. Verse 38, you do not have his word abiding in you. 
for you do not believe him whom he sent. He's speaking to the most religious leaders in existence of his day. You don't have his word abiding in you, which on the surface is a very ridiculous statement because they do. This is a group of men who literally have Genesis through Deuteronomy memorized. The law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, they know it by heart. And yet, all they do is debate the law, discuss the law, argue about which ones are more important than the other. This is all that they do. This is their life. But they really didn't have his word. They just knew it. They didn't believe it. And those aren't the same thing. Knowing what the Bible says and believing what the Bible says is all the difference. And Jesus says, because you've rejected me, you've rejected all of God's word because it points to me. And if you say I'm not who I say I am, you're rejecting the entirety of the Bible because it agrees with me. Unbelief is a wretched sin. It is better known as rejection. It's known as hard-heartedness. It's known as apathy towards the things of God. It's a lack of caring. It's a lack of placing value on what God values. Unbelief is when you've already decided without even looking at what God has to say, without even looking at the evidence, you've already decided this is not for me. I want nothing to do with this. The idea of a God is foolish to believe that you, this book is true, that is utterly ridiculous. That is the sin of unbelief. And that grievous sin will immediately condemn you. And that grievous sin will spring forth a host of other sins because from the place of unbelief, you're now willing to do anything and everything because you don't answer to any God ever, so you believe. So diagnosis, this is the first cause, unbelief. Second cause, unwillingness. Verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It's these that bear witness about me. So God steps off the witness stand and it's replaced by a Bible. Let's talk about your Bible. Let's talk about what it has said, this, this law that they know so well, this truth of God's word. Let it now testify on behalf of Jesus. He says, you search the scriptures. Search is the technical word for the formal study that's done by the rabbis. So you are in a formal, academic, intellectual setting. You're digging into these truths because you have a false understanding. You have somehow come to the belief that Bible knowledge equals eternal life. That you can quote a lot of verses, therefore, you're a Christian. Friends, Bible knowledge does not equate to eternal life. The Bible is not an end to itself. The Bible introduces you to the Savior. It reveals who God is, and he alone can grant eternal life. Those very texts that they're reading, those very texts that we read, they talk about him. They all point to Jesus. He's the fulfillment of it all. You can start on page one of your Bible and read all the way through it. You can scarcely go a single page without something somewhere pointing to him. So why is it that people can read the Bible and not believe in Jesus? How does that happen? How could you give to someone a, a gift of a Bible or a, a, a copy of just the Gospel of John or whatever it might be and they could read it and still reject? Verse 40, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. That's why they're unwilling. They see the text, they hear the arguments, they understand the content, they appreciate all the evidence, and then purposely walk away from it. How could someone do such a thing? Well, Jesus has already told us, chapter three, verse 19, 
He's the light that's come into the world, but they've rejected the light because men love the dark. This is the power of sin. It hardens our heart against love for God. It blinds our eyes to seeing the truth. It deafens our ears to hearing the voice of the Lord. And if he doesn't step in to cause your ears to hear, to open your eyes to see, to enliven your heart to believe, we are without hope. So that's the diagnosis. They're rejecting, that's why. The sin of unbelief and their unwillingness. So number two, here's the prognosis. Because that's the current reality for them. That's, that's their life. The prognosis is clear and it is catastrophic. Here's the first element of it, inability. Look at verse 41. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I've come in my Father's name, you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the only God? I don't receive glory from men. Now, he's already used the testimony of John the Baptist, but even before he did it, he said, he's just a man. It's just John. We like what John the Baptist said. It's true, but at the end of the day, he's not an authority figure. It's not enough. God must speak because when you, when you anchor your identity in what people say, you're in trouble. Allow me to illustrate something that I will Never lived down. The picture on your screen, the first picture, is Bob Russell. Some of you may know who Bob Russell is. Bob Russell is the now retired preacher of Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. When I was in college, Bob Russell was at the height of his career. He was the man. Known as a great leader, a strong Bible preacher, and my personal favorite attribute of him, he is short. I resonated with Bob, spent a lot of time at conferences at his church, got to meet Bob, interned with a man who was personal friends with Bob. And after I graduated, over the years, as I've worked at a few churches, twice in the last 24 years of my career, references have referred to me as, and I quote, the next Bob Russell, aren't you impressed? <laughs> it's probably because I'm short. <laughs> so the first time someone had said, he's the next Bob Russell, I had just graduated college and was in my first real interview process with a, a search team, and they said to me, hey, one of your references said you're the next Bob Russell. I almost fell out of my chair. There, no way, but they did. I, I don't, still, to this day, don't know who said that. And I, I was thrilled, and immediately, in my heart, I was like, I am totally getting this job. I'm the next Bob Russell. Yeah, take that. But then the search team responded with, um, who is Bob Russell? <laughs> cool, 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 cool. Well, that lost all of its power. The second time I was referred to as the next Bob Russell was when I was interviewing here. One of my references, again, I don't know who it was, said he's the next Bob Russell. Well, after I got here, after I started, uh, on the server was a PowerPoint presentation that the search team made up of, of people from this church on behalf of the elders had conducted the nationwide search to find the next preacher here. And they did, and to your eternal delight, it was me. <laughs> and when, when they narrowed down the process, I was the candidate, they're gonna take me to the elders for the elders to decide this is the guy or not the guy. Uh, the head of the search team created this lengthy, detailed PowerPoint presentation uh, to present me to the guys. And they walked through the whole process and who was on the team and, and, and how they did this and where they had posted everything. And then it got down to me and 
then there were several slides about me. And you know, th- this is you know, his, a description of him, this is his experience. And then they, they had a slide that said, this is what his references said about him. I'm gonna show you that slide. Go ahead and put that up. It was, it was very uh, flattering until the last line. Talk about bursting your bubble. (laughs) The next Bob Ross. So dear friends, I'm here to announce to you a career change. Put up the last slide if you would. (laughs) You know, if you anchor your identity in the opinions of man, it's not gonna work out well for you. All that matters is what God says. Jesus says, I I don't accept testimony from man. Why not? Why won't he accept the testimony of people who even say the truth about him? Certainly, these religious leaders who aren't saying the truth, why would he reject that? He was clear because they don't really love God. You don't have the love of God in you. You think that you do, and you say that you do, but you don't really do because of your unbelief, because of your unwillingness, all that you really show to God is hatred, not love. And he doesn't value what those would say about him. So much so, it's so bad, he says, if someone were to come in their own name, you would accept accept them, by their own authority you'd accept them, but I come on behalf of the God of the universe, your God, the God of Israel, to come to you, to reveal him to you, and you reject me. Verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another? You do not seek the glory that's from the only God. How can you believe? The answer, you can't. You can't. When you are so busy, focused on yourself, there is no room for God. Jesus said in John 3 to Nicodemus, unless someone is born from above, they do not have eternal life in them. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 says that Jesus died so that we would no longer live for ourselves, which tells us that's our default posture, is to live for self. We are the standard. And as long as we're focused on us, well, there's no room for Jesus at all. Listen to how Paul put it, Romans chapter eight, starting in verse six. He said, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh are not able to please God. If you decide that your focus is you, and you live anchored in unbelief and unwillingness, you become unable to believe. Unable on your own outside of a miraculous regenerating work of God himself, you are unable to believe. Second part of the prognosis is ignorance. Ignorance, verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you've set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So as Jesus is preaching this sermon, we haven't heard a single word from the crowd. They haven't spoken since they found out it was Jesus who healed the guy on the Sabbath that made them so mad. There has not been an exchange or a give and take. I would argue because the villains in this account, these religious leaders sitting listening to this sermon from Jesus have been sitting on a bomb that they are ready to ignite. They have Moses, the lawgiver. Moses is their hope. 
They literally have Genesis to Deuteronomy memorized. They know the Old Testament better than you could ever imagine. Life is consumed by the study of the law of Moses. Moses is their life. Moses is their hope. And as Jesus has been saying all of this, they've been sitting there silently waiting for their day in court. Because all they have to do is stand up and say, we stand on Moses. And in John chapter 8, that is exactly what they say. We have Moses. So imagine the shock of this moment at the end of this sermon when their star witness, who's sitting in the back of the courtroom, Moses, the lawgiver himself, is called to the stand as a witness for the prosecution. He is a witness for Jesus and against them. Their hope has risen up to testify against them. Moses wrote about me, he says. Well, in two ways. One, Moses wrote about Jesus quite literally. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, the, the, uh, another prophet to come who will arise, that's Jesus. And Moses wrote about Jesus morally. Because if these religious leaders really knew the law like they think they know the law, they would fall on their faces and confess their sin and embrace their savior. And the fact that they don't shows they don't really know the law at all. Because that is the purpose of the law, to condemn sinners and help them to see the need for a savior. And because they've rejected Jesus, it shows they've rejected Moses as well. Jesus said in Matthew 5, he is the fulfillment of the law. John Calvin said Jesus is the end and the soul of the law. If you reject Jesus, you reject the law as well. So now what? The sermon's over. Quite the mic drop moment for Jesus. And their silence is deafening. They don't have a response. There's no words they can say. They have nothing to come in their defense because everything, even what they hoped in, everything is accusing them and testifying for Jesus. What do you hope in for your salvation? What is it about your life that comforts you like a warm blanket on a cold night? Is it your own righteousness? Is it your success? Is it your morality? Is it all your Bible knowledge? Is it the reality that you really are a good person? Is it that, well, at least I'm not Hitler? Is it, well, I, I do what I do because if you, if you knew my circumstances, you would understand that I'm justified in doing what I've done. What is it that you wrap around you to feel so cozy and comfortable, this is what makes me feel secure? All of that is worthless in the face of Christ, no matter what it is. Everything that you have hoped in will rise up against you at the judgment and accuse you. Our only hope is in the life that Jesus alone can give. Listen again to how Paul put it, Philippians chapter three, starting in verse seven. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God upon faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. 
There is one hope in life and death, and that is the risen and reigning Lord Jesus Christ, and by faith in him, you are righteous, and by no other means will you ever be declared righteous. Let's pray. My Father, thank you for the work of Jesus. Thank you for the the confrontation that Jesus offers to these religious leaders because we're guilty of similar things, of wrapping ourselves in our own sense of righteousness, of comforting ourselves with our own sense of goodness, of thinking we are much better than we are, of without realizing it, without intending to do so, finding our ultimate hope, finding our comfort, finding our righteousness in us and what we've done and who we are. And that never works. All those things are a loss when compared to Christ. They're not a gain. The resume is worthless. So by the work of Jesus Christ alone, by his saving work that has awakened dead hearts, opened blind eyes, by his work, we've been saved. Because on our own, we live in unbelief. On our own, we are unwilling. But by your work, you make us willing. You give us new affections. You draw us to Christ to help us to see who he is and what he's done. Thank you for providing the path to life. Thank you for the truth of the Bible that opens our eyes to who you are. As we do every week, we take a piece of bread and a cup of juice and with them we remember this saving work of Jesus for sinners like us. Thank you for him, we remember him now. In his name we pray, amen.